So uh, we're back for part two. And what I think we're going to do uh, tonight is break up the Shira by characters, not by uh, not by psukim or by chronology, uh, because I think it helps us tell the story of Shiras Devora a little bit more effectively. So for the purposes of review, uh, what we did last week was we looked at the relationship between Devora and Barak, as it appears in the story, the relationship between uh, the prophetess of the story and the general who leads the Jewish people into battle. Um, as we pointed out last week, even though we don't have any indication of Devorah participating in the battle, Barak refuses to go unless Devorah will join him um, in the battle. So she says she's going to do that, even though we have no reference to her being at war. Uh, but we looked at that relationship, and we looked at the relationship between uh, Devorah and her husband, Lapido. And it's no surprise that Chazal see a deep connection between Devorah and Lapidos and Barak and suggest that it may not be the simplest reading of the text, but it certainly is the simplest narrative of the story that, in fact, Barak and Lapidos are the very same person and the general who Devorah convinces to lead the Jewish people into battle against the general of Canaan is none other than her husband. Now, what we saw last week uh, in particular was the position uh, or the suggestion of the Ralbag. And the Ralbag's comment in a brief review is that there appears to be a very deep connection between the character of Devora in this short story and the role of Moshe Rabbeinu in taking the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim. Um, and therefore, the obvious connection is, of course, Moshe taking the people out of Mitzrayim, crossing the Yam, and then singing Shira. And here we have a shira, so az yashir Moshe uvenei Yisrael, az yashir, then we have um, uh, the shira of Devora and Barak that follows in our story as well. Devora is, of course, the Niviyah, and in the same way that um, Chazal uh, ascribed many great qualities to Moshe Rabbeinu, many different leadership roles, or a wide portfolio, you might say, the same is true for Devora. So she is the Niviyah, and she is the Shofetet of the Jewish people. Um, and she's also, you know, a woman and a wife in this story as well. She has many different functions. So the Rabag takes it to the extreme. Her husband's name is Lapido. She is responsible for the creation of light, Lapid being a source of fire. Um, and in that relationship, there is separation, the same separation that existed between Moshe and Sipora. he suggests, exists between Devorah and Barak, which is why Barak needs to be summoned from another place because he and Devorah are not alongside one another. And in the same way that Moshe Rabbeinu was a great prophet who also led the Jewish people strategically into this amazing event. So the same thing is true for Devorah. Devorah does the very same thing. She is the one who leads the Jewish people. She is a person of, of total and unrelenting confidence in the victory of this war. She knows exactly how it's going to play out. And so the way the Navi tells it is it plays out exactly the way she said that she would. Um, and at the same time, because, and this, will, this is going to be part of our theme for tonight, because uh, Devorah is also a woman and a wife in this story, so she tells the story, in this, in this sense it's different than Moshe Rabbeinu, part of the story through the lens of being a woman and wife. And that's going to take shape as we, as we move forward as well. Um, and for that reason, the first relationship of our story that is key to understand is the relationship between Devorah and her husband or Devorah and Barak the general, which again, may be the same one relationship all in the same. So we have two more relationships that Devorah has or Devorah creates in this story. And what we're gonna do is tonight, we're gonna look at the second relationship and next week we'll look at the third one. So the second relationship that Devorah has is with the other heroine of our story. And that of course, is Yael, who killed the general Sisra. So to remind you, if you uh, were not with us last time, as the story goes, Yael is married. Well, let's take a look at it in the text together for a second. I'll put it up on the screen. Um, Yael. Yael is married to Hever Hakani. Hever Hakani, the one thing we know about him for sure is he is a descendant of Yisro. 
uh, you know, the people that come from Midian. Um, and they ha the reason um, that they're significant in this story is because Hever Hakeni um, or the people um, of Hever's family have a peaceful relationship both with the Jews who they live in close proximity to, as well as Yavin, the king of Kinnan. So they are perfectly situated as a family uh, to be neutral in this story. So Sisra nas Biragla. So when Sisra flees the battle, because it's obvious that the battle is being lost, so he runs from the battlefield and the closest possible ally that he has is Hever HaKeni. Hever HaKeni is not home, but Yael, his wife is home. And as we saw in the story last week, Yael welcomes him into the home and she deceives him. She initially hides him. She offers him uh, milk. She, so to speak, puts him to sleep. Um, and then she murders him in his sleep and presents him to Barak the general. So the first thing that you'll notice, which is the great irony of this story, and it's something that we've touched on in previous uh, classes in the past, is that the names of characters in the Navi, it's not always true in the Chumash, but in the Navi it's true more so, the names of the characters are always a giveaway for the role that they play in the story. This is especially true in the Book of Rus, where every character has a very purposeful name. And it seems to be true here as well, because you have a man named Hever. And the first question you ask yourself is, who exactly is he a friend of, right? The very question in this story is, where are the allegiances of Yael and Hever? Is there allegiance with the Jewish people? Is there allegiance with the people of Canaan? That's a mystery, at least at the beginning of the story, not entirely different from what we saw last week, where on the one hand, uh, Devorah says, if I go with you to battle, the enemy will fall in the hands of a woman, and it's not clear if that woman is Devorah or that woman is Yael. So the same thing seems to be true. The great irony of this story is that Sisra runs to the house of Hever because he sees Hever as a friend, but ultimately, Hever and his wife are friends, not of the people of Canaan, but they are the people, uh, Hever, or they are the friends of the people of Israel. So um, that is the first question that I want to tackle tonight before we get to the way that Devorah talks about Yael and the Shira, because we read the story last week. But I want to talk about this relationship. Who are the, who is this family? Right? We already know from the beginning of the story that Yael and Hever aren't living with the Kani anymore. They're not living with the Jews. They're kind of in between. They're in, in no man's land. So who exactly are they? And what is their relationship uh, to the Jewish people? So two interesting comments. There is an, an essay that I discovered, thanks to Google, um, that was written by Dvar Torah, by Rabbi Moshe Meiselman. And in it, he talks about, it's really Dvar Torah about Yisro. And he, this is what he says. We'll read it together. What's amazing about Yisro is how much can a person see the MS and still be torn by other considerations that hold him back, right? To be an indecisive personality. Yisro is searching truth, he discovers truth, but he still wavers back and forth. So we see this theme in many personalities in Barathees. We also see this theme emerging very subtly after the battle between Barak and Devorah versus Sisra and the king of Canaan. At the end of the battle, Sisra flees and finds refuge in the tent of Yael, the wife of Hever Akeni. He was a descendant of Yisro, and strangely enough, the Navi tells us they made a pact with the kingdom of Canaan. This is why Sisra fled to his territory because he thought it was a friendly territory. So why did Hever Akeni make a pact with the enemy of Klal Yisrael? So first of all, Rabbi Meiselman's assumption that Hever Akeni as a descendant of Yisrael would obviously be, have peaceful relations with Jews is not necessarily a fair assumption, but the question is still the question. Why does Hever Akeni make a pact with Canaan? So apparently because he wanted to hedge his bets. Hever Akeni, like his ancestor Yisro, couldn't make an absolute commitment to the MS. He couldn't make the final irrevocable step. Now, this version, his Rabbi Meiselman's version of Hever's thinking, it, it may be a little bit um, a more theologically inclined than I might have looked at the story, but I agree with the basic premise of what he's saying. It's not just geographically the case that Yael and Hever happen to live somewhere between the Israelites and the Canaanites. That is just symbolic of the fact that they're kind of torn between two cities. They don't have particular allegiances in one way or the other. They probably could have lived well among the Canaanites. They probably could have lived well among the Jews. In fact, for a while, they lived well between them both. And it's only uh, in this moment where Yael really shines, maybe more so than her husband. 
So Professor Yehuda Ali Tzor, who is the commentary uh, for Das Mikra's uh, volume on Sefer Shoftim, he makes almost the same point, but not for theological reasons, just for political reasons. I didn't have an English translation, but here's the, the Hebrew on the sheet. Shalom bein Yavinu bein Chever Akeni. Af al pisha Akenim hayu bali brisne amanam liyisrael kal yamim. Even though we see in the beginning of Sefer Shoftim that the Kenim have a good peaceful relationship with their Jewish neighbors, lo gilu as asher im libam. They never really told the Canaanites that, right? That's none of the Canaanites' business that the descendants of Yisro get along with the Jews. So they're not trying, they're just trying to stay as neutral as they possibly can. So they technically have a peace treaty with the, with the Jews, and they technically have peaceful relations with the Canaanim. It's not a contradiction between the two. It might be very convenient. It wouldn't be the first time in history that someone had peace agreements with both sides. So then the question of course is, if they have this peaceful relationship, if until this moment, the family of Hever Akeni or the, the, the tribe that Hever and Yael come from have remained neutral, why do they take the extreme measures that they do? Right, or why does she, Yael, take this action on to, uh, to kill Sisra? So he explains on the next page, Kedei lehochiach she'akeni shomer emunim Yisrael. Below Hishlimim Hakinanim Elame Ones. The argument that Professor Elitzor makes in reading the text is that in a in an act of demonstration of allegiances to the Jews that lived in the land of Israel, Yael kills Sisra and shows her willingness to live under Jewish rule. Yeah, you could read this cynically, or you could read it not cynically. The cynic can say, well, guess what just happened? The Jewish people have a tremendously strong leader in Devorah the prophetess. She predicts uh, annihilation of the enemy in the battlefield. They essentially draw Sisera into a battle that he should easily win, and they defeat him very easily. So it's pretty obvious, uh, one would think, that the winning side, right, the right side of history, if you will, is going to be with Devorah's camp. So in this moment where Yael and her husband are living um, in between these two worlds, between these two cities, so she has this very important decision to make and she chooses to go with the winner, which is not such a, such a rich, risky decision per se. However, it's important to note that Devorah in her Shira celebrates Yael's uh, a, a decision and her heroism without any cynicism whatsoever. And that, of course, lends to the belief that uh, Yael and Hever have a deep, true relationship with the Jews who live next door to them. So that, perhaps, is the first clue to understanding uh, this piece of the story. What exactly is this relationship between the descendants of Yisro? Um, it's, of course, ironic, not ironic, but really profound on the part of the Ralbag, who believes that everything that happens in Devorah's life is essentially a mirror to the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. So the people coming to the rescue are the women from the house of Yisro in the same way that Moshe was the one who rescued the daughters of Yisro so many generations earlier. That, of course, is uh, really amazing. The Rabaldic doesn't say it explicitly, but I think it's pretty clear um, that it fits his theory well. So now what I want to show you is something very interesting. Um, the fourth parak of Shoftim is the story that we read last week. The fifth parak of Shoftim is the Shira. And most of the Shira we're going to study next week, but I wanted to focus to very, towards the end. There's only about 30 Pesukim in the Shira, so the Pesuk uh, Chavdalet to Chavzai in 24 to 27 is pretty much at the end. Um, and towards the end of the Shira, Devorah celebrating their victory in battle um, uh, describes prophetically uh, the heroism of Yael. You know, it's worth pointing out that the Shira is written with Nevua. We believe that it is a prophetic song in the same way that the song of Moshe Rabbeinu as Yashir is a prophetic song. What makes Shira different from other forms of Nevua? So there is one very important, even though it's a totally obvious distinction, it's just important to keep in mind. The distinction between a traditional Nevua and a Shira is that a traditional Nevua either speaks about the present or it speaks about the future. The Navi tells us something that is going to happen or something that's likely to happen. What's the role of the Shira? Is a prophetic celebration of history. The fact that Moshe Rabbeinu, along with the Jewish people, or Devorah, along with Barak, are able to uh, uh, formalize 
um, in, a, in a biblical sense, uh, their experience for all of history, almost in the moment that it takes place, is prophetic in nature. Az Yashir Moshe, right? Normally, if you think about how long does it take Esther and Mordechai to figure out exactly what the language of the Megillah should be. So they wrote it, but they didn't write it while Haman was still hanging in the gallows. I assume they took some time and there were careful edits before it came together. That was written by Ruach HaKodesh. But the Shira, uh, Az Yashir, and in this case, Shira Stavora, which happens very quickly after, is prophetic. I would also point out that, yeah, that Devora in her Shira describes things that she likely did not see. And that's what one element of her prophecy is that's so interesting, right? The role of the prophet is sometimes to articulate things that may not have been seen by others, but the prophet knows to be true. Moshe Rabbeinu does this a few times in the Chumash. Moshe tells us about things that, um, that nobody would, would have any way of knowing about, and that's why it's important to have a nevua about the past. It's not like there's anything to predict, but there's no way to know that it happened. So in the interest of interaction here, I would challenge anybody to turn off their mute for a second, see who's still awake and paying attention. Okay, where does Moshe Rabbeinu tell us a story that we would have no way of knowing if not for his prophecy? Marty turned his mute off first. I don't know if that was on purpose or not. Mm -hmm. Not listening. <laughs> Okay, it wasn't anybody know what it is? A story Moshe Rabbeinu tells us. It's interesting because we all know the story, so we all take for granted, oh, well, it's a story in the Chumash. Everybody knows it. Is there a story in the Chumash that the Jewish people would not have known if Moshe didn't tell it to them? It's so obvious, but you never think about it this way. I got it. Bal uh, Balak. Balak. Excellent. Oh, very nice. Very nice. You ever think about the fact that most Jews, probably all Jews, never met Bilam in their life? They never met Balak. So how do we know that that story took place? Right, because he's off on a mountaintop somewhere trying to, to curse us unsuccessfully, right? So we're singing, we must know it from somewhere. So it's a prophecy. So sometimes prophecies are about the past and they share information that we may not otherwise know. So that is one of Devorah's roles. I don't think Devorah necessarily knew with certainty exactly what happened in Yael's tent. But on the other hand, that's part of what the beauty of this prophecy is. She understands the way the story unfolded. And what seems to be very quickly is that Yael is able to, that Devorah is able to, to sing, Devorah is able to craft the perfect prophetic version of this story so that events of the past can be celebrated for all of the Jewish future. So, what does she say about Yael? Tivorah, this is Pasuk Chavdal, you can see it in the Hebrew or right below, uh, right below in the English paragraph. Tivorah minashim Yael eshes chever hakeni, minashim ba'ohel tivorah. Remember, it's a shira, so the, the verses here are meant to be poetic and they're balanced on two sides. So, most blessed of women is Yael, or perhaps, as we'll see in a second, uh, that Yael is blessed by other women. Other women will praise her. The wife of Hever Akeni, mi nashim ba'ohel tivorach, most blessed of women in the tents. And we're going to focus on that, Pasuk, what exactly it means. But of the women in the tents, she is blessed. Now we know the murder weapon with which she killed Sisra was a peg from her own tent, which is incredibly significant symbolism in the story. So of the women in the tents, Yael is celebrated. Mayim Sha'al, he, meaning Sisra, asked for water, but she was very crafty. She offered him milk instead in a princely bowl. She brought him curds. In other words, she brought him a very generous portion of something in a very dignified way, which led him to believe that she was, in fact, a chaver, a chavera, a friend of his, when, of course, she wasn't. And then yada layaseid tishlachna. So she reached out her hand for the peg, the, her left hand, the amina lehalmos amelim, and then her right hand for the workman's hammer, right, the hammer with which you um, put the pegs into the ground. And she struck Sisra and she crushed his head, smashed and pierced his temple. Bein ragleha, which either means between her legs or here it's translated as at her feet, Kara nafal shachav. He sank 
and he fell or he lay down and shachav, he outstretched himself. Bein ragleha, between her feet, by her feet. Kara nafal, uh, he, his feet sank and he lay still. Kara sham nafal shadu, where he sank, there he lay destroyed or you know, more literally murdered. So it's interesting, Chazal have a lot to say about Pasuk Chav Zayin. We're not going to focus on it, but some of the more modern commentaries on the Pasuk suggest that what's being conveyed here is that when Sisra arrived in her home, he was already injured from battle. Kara nafal shachav, kara nafal basher, kara sham nafal shadud, means he stumbled his way into her home. He was either physically hurt or more likely he was exhausted from battle. The battle itself was probably pretty strenuous, and then escaping the battle to make it to her home was exhausting. So he was already in a very vulnerable position, which she uh, took advantage of uh, by treating him respectfully and putting him to bed so that, um, so that she could kill him. So I want to focus on a bunch of different points uh, of, this, uh, of, this, of this celebration of Yael's action that emerged from the text, but also from the way that Chazal uh, our sages do read this text. And the, uh, the best example, I think, um, is a very interesting Yalkut Shimoni, a very interesting medrash about Yael's choice of weapon. So we saw this last week. I'll share some images in a second because in Christian art, this is a very popular image for obvious reasons. Yael chooses a very graphic way uh, to kill Sisra. And Chazal are curious about this as much as you are. So the Alkut Shimoni says as follows. Ein yad small. Okay, she used her left hand, left hand for the peg and right hand for the hammer, as you see in the Pasak. Yadi So Yadi is for reference to the left hand. Your hand in your right hand, etc. Okay. Okay. Zehu, so the manager, let me see if I can highlight this so you can see where I am. This section here. Zehu sha'amar hakasav yadeha shilcha bakishor. So everybody remembers probably from Friday night, the Pasuk in Mishle, which is a uh, uh, one of the verses in, in Eish Yishchayel. The Pasuk is right here below uh, in Mishle Parak Laman Aleph. Chagra ba'oz masneha vata'a She girds herself, this is the Eish Yishchayel, with strength, of course, and perform, for, performs her tasks with vigor. Tama kitov sachra. She sees that her business uh, thrives. Lo yichbe balaylanera. Her lamp never goes out at night. Yadeha shilcha bakishor. She sets her hands to the distaff, right, which is the the wooden piece of equipment that's used when you're weaving things. The kapeha tamchu palach, and her fingers work the spindle. So the yada shilcha bakishor is talking about a woman who sews, and the distaff, the wooden equipment that she uses when she sews. So the al Shimoni, go back up to the previous paragraph, says this reference, it's not clear, by the way, who Aisha Schail is written for. It's very likely in Chazal's eye that it refers to all the great women of Jewish history. And each Pasuk refers to somebody else. So the al Shimoni says, Zeshamar Akasav Yada Sholcha Bakishor, Zu Yael. Let me highlight it for you. Shalo Hargaso Bekli Zayin, Ella Biyaseid. The woman holding the wooden tool is a reference in Aisha Schail to the act of murder committed with Yael, who did not choose to kill Sisra with a weapon. That's what Klizai means, with a sword or something like that. She reached out her hand for the Yased. So asked the al Why didn't she grab her husband's sword and murder him the traditional way? So the Medrash says, "Lakai mashinemar lo yekli gever alisha." In Sefer Tevarim, the Torah tells us that women aren't supposed to wear men's clothing, and men aren't supposed to wear women's clothing. And the Alkut Shimoni here, and the Alkut Shimoni there, and other Midrashim in the Gemara, etc., have a suggestion that kli gever doesn't just mean men's shirts and women's skirts, but it also refers to the kind of tools or equipment that they use. There are tool belts for men and tool belts for women. There are things that men do and there are things that women do. So the weapons of war, according to the Yalka Chimoni, are the weapons of men. And Yael is the heroine of our story. So she's not going to use a tool's weapons that she's not supposed to use. So the Yalka says, no, 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 no. She was obviously using something that was more 
in her domain than in his domain. So this is a very strange medrash to begin with. The halachic uh, uh, suggestion is itself very interesting in general, but in particular in this story, it really deserves our attention because everything is very gendered in the story of Devorah, seen through the lens of not the prophet, but the prophetess, seen through the, through the lens of Yael and not through Hever. And the Alkut Shimoni says, in her own way, she is celebrated in Asia Schal, Yedel HaShel Chabakishor, is a reference to the, to the fact that she took a weapon, or she took a tool rather than a weapon, to commit this act and kill Sisra. So why is the Medrash doing this? Right? How is this a celebration? It's just to say that Yael was a very religious person. As I pointed out, Yael is not necessarily a Jewish woman. She's probably a distant cousin of the Jewish people. That's about it. So that itself is a very interesting thing to consider. I just want, to hold, want you to hold on to that question, and hopefully we will try and answer it. You can see on the left side of the next page, I hope the pictures are clear enough even on the shared screen. As I mentioned before, the image of Yael killing Sisra is a very, very popular artistic rendering. Um, anyone who can't see them clearly, I'll try and zoom in a little. I'm happy to share them afterwards so you can get the, all of them are available on Wikipedia. They're easy to, to easy to find. Um, but in the 18th century and the 19th century, you see these amazing different versions of the story. Here in the middle one, Yael is, of course, showing the dead body to Barak, as we saw in the text last week. So is this the person you're looking for? So that's the 19th century uh, equivalent. You have it in paintings, and you have it in enamel plaques, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all over the place. These very um, graphic images of the act that Yael commits. Either way, um, Chazal have their own image of, or the al Shimoni certainly does, of Yael fulfilling her, her task in the most uh, religious of possible ways. Either way, uh, the tent is obviously the central um, location in this story for her, um, and it's critical in the Shira itself. Tevorah picks up on this repeatedly, as we just saw. She is Tevorach minashim, minashim ba'ohel Tevorach. So, what exactly is this ohel? What is the reference? So Rashi, source six here, Rashi says some very, very interesting things, and the Ral Bag does as well. Rashi writes me Nashim ohel. Who is that referring to? Who are the Nashim ohel? the other women who are home and not going to battle? So Nashim is with a capital nun. In other words, Nashim ohel refers to the matriarchs of Jewish history. So she is blessed from or by or similar to the matriarchs um, of the Chumash. Sarah, Shenemar Ba, Hine Ba Ohel, Rivka, Shenemar Ba, Vayvia Hayitcha Ka Ohela, Rachel Valea, Shenemar Bahen, Vayitse Me Ohelea, etc. We talk often in Sefer Bracious about Sarah and her tent, Rivka in her tent, Rachel and Leah in their tents. So Rashi suggests that the Navi and Devorah in her Shira. Are, are positioning Yael next to uh, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Now, we don't have um, examples. I mean, Rivka and Rachel take some measures of, of uh, courage in some of their actions, but we don't have any actions similar to Yael's. It's an interesting grouping to say Yael being, not, uh, being considered Nashim Ba'ohel Tivorach is a reference to the fact that she is very similar to these matriarchs. That itself is really interesting. But Rashi continues. So the women of the tents will tivorach yael will bless her. What does that mean? The Medrash that Rashi quotes says this is why the women praise her, because here they are raising their children, trying to build the next generation of the Jewish people, and Sisera is going to wipe them all out. They're all vulnerable. They're all worried about their future. Someone needs to fight for them. And if not for Yael, all of their effort in raising their families uh, would be lost. Now, again, it's important to remember, because it really jumps out at you throughout this story, one of the major tensions is the relationship or the comparison between Devorah and Yael. But the reason we can make that comparison is because what Devorah does is compares 
Yael to the other women or to the Jewish women of the story. Devorah is not in her tent. She doesn't have one. Yael is in her tent, but she's not waiting for the soldiers to do their battle. Think about the language of the Yalkut. She's not using the men's equipment, but she is the most significant uh, hero of the story. With the equipment of her tent in her own personal space, she commits the act that is most significant for the Jewish victory. And then Rashi makes a third point. Each of these is very different from one another. Sometimes Rashi says a bunch of things in a row that are all very similar, and sometimes two Rashis are almost opposite of one another. Davar Acher, the last Rashi. Ath Yael Haisa Yosheves Ohalim. Lefika Chizkir Osa Bebirchas Ohalim. Not entirely clear what Rashi means, or it's a little bit mysterious. Because Yael is a homemaker, because Yael is someone who stays home, she is Tivorach Minashim. So what you'll see is, in fact, that the tension between Devorah and Yael is the fact that Devorah is found beneath the palm trees. She is out in the open. She is judging the Jewish people. And Yael is stuck at home. But in her act of heroism from her own home, Yael saves Devorah and she saves the Jewish people. As we know, she is the woman who, uh, whose uh, sister will fall into her hands. Now, the Ralbag, as we've been studying a lot of Ralbag together, does something very interesting as well. Tivorach minashim. Ralbag says, Amnam ya'el tiye brucha, ki azra lahem bahariga sisra, vi yoser minashim shehin ba'ohel tivorach. So more than the women who stayed home, Yael is a heroine. That's what we just explained in Rashi as well. Right? When we talk about um, Yaakov and Esav, and Yaakov is described as someone who is an Ishtam, Yoshev Ohalim. So Chazal, of course, celebrate that as saying that he is more pious than his brother, that he is more learned than his brother. He's engaged in Torah. So Yael, Yael Rabbach says the same thing. She's Tivorach Minashim, Shein Ba'oa Lilmo Torah. V'yiyya haratzon bazeh ki killas maroz amar malach Hashem v'ulam birchas Yael amra devora al-tzad ha-tzfila v'habracha. So it's really a celebration of who Yael was and what she represented that brings this story full circle. So um, in kind of an amazing fashion, uh, Devorah celebrates the total irony uh, of Yael's victory, that she is different than all the other women in this story. She's different than Devorah. She's different than the women who didn't go to battle. And perhaps that's what the Al-Kachimoni is struggling with, not just the halacha itself of what kind of weapon did she use and which weapons were was she supposed to use, but they're trying to figure out what the symbolism of Yael's act of heroism is is all about. So on the one hand, she is the hostess of this story, Mayim Sha'al Chalav Nasana. But on the other hand, in her own crafty way, she's of course the greatest, um, the greatest soldier uh, that brings this story to full, uh, to full circle. So with that in mind, I think it's important to kind of conceptualize what the three pieces of this story are, are really about. The first, the first piece is Devorah figuring out what her role in the survival of the Jewish people is, right? Her relationship with her husband and her um, relationship to the soldiers, her relationship to the generals, and her relationship to the enemy, which almost doesn't exist at all. But when she sings her song, the pinnacle of Shiraz Devorah is a celebration of the woman that Devorah herself sees as the real hero. And she, in a certain sense, is contrasting her own role, which is prestigious in a certain sense, but not as uh, tangibly effective as the role of Yael with Yael's role, which is, of course, in a lot of ways more, uh, more significant and celebrated as the real hero um, of the story. But now we have to think about uh, the third woman of this story and what she, what she tells us. And that's what we're going to do next week. The third woman of this story, most famously, is none other than the mother of Sisera. And what we'll see when we study about the mother of Sisera, which is that right at the very, very end of the Shira, uh, we'll see two things. 
Number one, we'll see a different kind of relationship, right? Not between a woman who is the prophetess and the general, not between the husband and the wife. Hever, the friend of our story, is uh, suspiciously absent from the story in every way, um, which is often the case in, in Safer Shoftim, by the way. Um, that's true. Uh, but now we have a mother who is intimately affected by the consequences of this battle, but plays no role in the story at all. So what you actually have is a very interesting triangle between three different women and three different roles. Devorah, of course, at the top, and then Yael at one side and the mother of Sistra on the other. And we'll try and bring it full circle next week to see how Devorah sees herself relative to, to both of them. Sisra's mother remaining at home, Yael at home, but finds herself in the middle of the action, and Devorah, who again promises to lead the people into war, but we don't actually see her doing that. The second thing that Devorah does in this story, which is really important, and it hasn't been our focus, but it should, it, to a certain extent, it should be, and we'll give it the time that it deserves next week, um, is Devorah's uh, mission is to unify the Jewish people in an attempt to win this war. And what seems to be clear at this moment in Sefer Shoftim, this is before the Jewish people have a Beis Hamikdash, they have a Mishkan, this is before the Jewish people have a king, Shaul is not yet the king of the Jewish people, we're still in a different era, um, there isn't unity among the Shvatim. The tribes aren't as connected as, uh, as she would want them to be. So who joins Yael in this battle and who doesn't join her? The tribes that are willing to go to battle alongside Barak and those that say, now we'll pass on this one, we'll come to the next one, um, is a measure of her success as a leader. Is she able to get the Jewish people off the couch and onto the battlefield? Or are they passing because it's not happening in their own backyard? And what you'll have to keep in mind for next week, this is the teaser for those who'll be with us for part three, um, is that she is in a certain sense uh, finishing the mission of Moshe Rabbeinu. After all, remember, after Moshe Rabbeinu finds out that he's not allowed to enter the land of Israel, he's confronted by Ruvain, God, and Chatzim Minasha saying, we don't want to go in. We'd rather stay on the far side. Moshe is, of course, horrifically offended by that. He would give up everything to make it into the land of Israel. And the condition by which Ruvain, God, and Chatzim Minasha are able to stay there is if they promise to stick up for their fellow Jews in war, even though they live far away when they're called to arms, they'll always join. So it's no surprise that Devorah sees herself um, as responsible for unifying the people, particularly when they have to go to battle. And how ironic it is that the one person who wasn't called up to arms, the one person who doesn't have the weaponry to go to war is the person who commits the single most symbolic act of saving the Jewish people. That, of course, is Yael. So she is really the central figure that connects these two extremes. We've already talked about Devorah. Now we've added a little bit of color to Yael. And next week, we'll finish up with understanding what the role of Sistra's mother is in developing Devorah's song. So yes, it's true, in conclusion, that Devorah's Shira, which is a prophecy, and a prophecy about things that already uh, took place, Devorah's Shira is about the past but it is also a political mission statement for herself. You might call it like a state of the union. The battle is won, but what does it mean for us? Who came and who didn't? How unified are we? How divided are we as a people? Who are the heroes? Who are the villains? Who are the strong uh, victors? Um, and who are those that are just lucky to have had this one pass them by? And these are all the things that are going through Devorah's mind as she formulates her song. So next week, we will do both of those things. We'll look at the Devorah's attempt to unify the Jewish people through this battle, where she succeeds and where she fails, how she, how she writes that song. Um, and finally, the, the most beautiful, dramatic, and uh, painful part of the, of the Shira is when Devorah tries to imagine the experience of Sisera's mother when she realizes that her son has been murdered and more. Okay, so we're going to hold here for tonight. I want to thank everybody for joining, as always. Uh, I want to wish you a...